Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this meeting of Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul Council's Audit and Governance Committee. Um, welcome to members of the committee, to members of the council uh, who are tuning into this, to officers uh, and to members of the public. We'll start the agenda with... Uh, Apologies for the technical delay. We'll start the meeting with apologies. Uh, Mr. Hanton. Apologies, Chairman. That was... Uh technical fault on my microphone there. Um, as, um, good evening, everybody. I'll, st I'll start off with the, the housekeeping notices. Um, pl please note that uh, this meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee has been recorded by the Council and will be published on the Council website for a minimum of six months. Any councillors or officers not in the room and wishing to speak, please use the raise your hand feature and switch on your video. Please also note that there may be some members of this committee who have given apologies for this meeting for reasons such as self-isolation or illness. Although these members may address the meeting remotely at the discretion of the chairman, they are not able to vote. And finally, chairman, please could members ensure that background noise is kept to a minimum and that mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. Could I ask you to take so I received um, apologies from Councillor Brooke, uh, and I believe Councillor Cox has indicated that he's delayed in travelling to the meeting and will be joining us as soon as he can. There, there have been no substitutes appointed, Chairman. So if I could, uh, through you, Chairman, ask if any members have a declaration of interest. Vice Chairman. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> um, I'm a member of the Lower Gardens Trust, which I understand is being discussed this evening. Chairman, yeah, we've um, received no public issues for tonight's meeting. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Hanson. So we'll go to the substantive items on the agenda, starting at um, item four, which is the confirmation of minutes uh, for the meeting held on the 28th of October 2021. Uh, members who are present, are you happy that I sign those as a true and accurate record of that meeting? That's agreed. I can't see any items on there uh, as matters arising that are not covered either elsewhere on the agenda or have been previously covered between that meeting and the one this evening. So we'll move on then to item six on the agenda, uh, which is the 2020-21 Statement of Accounts and Audit Findings Report. And this follows on, obviously, from the briefing uh, that was available to all members of Audit and Governance on the 25th of November. Uh, and um, I will ask uh, for uh, Adam Richens, uh, who is uh, online with us this evening as the Council's Chief Financial Officer, uh, to make a statement on this item. Mr. Richens. Yes, thank you, Chair. And just for the record, my name is Adam Richens. I'm the Council's um, Director of Finance. Um, so this item on the agenda basically um, provides some background detail as to the position we're in, um, in respect of the 2020-21 Statement of Accounts, and highlights the fact that um, the, we originally intended to bring this item forward to this committee, but for the reasons set out on the face of the agenda, um, the, the position has now been um, delayed and the intention is to defer um, your consideration of the report until um, January when we hope to bring it forward um, in its fullness and in a complete state. Um, 
just by way of background, I think, Chair, you referenced the fact that there was a training session um, on the 2020-21 Statement of Accounts last week for all members of Audit Committee, and the detail and background as to the rationale um, for that deferment was, um, you know, we went into in a bit further detail. But just way to maybe to, to add to that, um, on the 26th of November, I received a letter from Catherine Francis, who's a Director General of the Local Government Strategy and Analysis at the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Um, they are the systems leaders for local audit. And as part of that letter, they highlighted that 91% of the 2020-21 local audits have missed the statutory deadline of the 30th of September. Um, the reasons cited for that are multifaceted um, and include the valuation of P&E uh, plant and equipment, the valuation of the pension fund, um, and the general additional need to be more robust in the process than perhaps um, we were previously or you know, the industry as a sector was previously. Um, she highlighted the fact that £15 million has been made available by government as part of the autumn budget to help implement the recommendations of the Redmond, Redmond Review. And she highlighted the fact that, that she will bring forward plans to try and get the whole sector back on track um, in due course. Just by way of background, the council published its um, draft accounts by the 17th of June, on the 17th of June, which was before the statutory deadline of the 30th of June. Clearly, we are now in that audit process, and it does need to, to ensure that there is sufficient time allowed for the robustness of that process um, to be undertaken so we all can get the confidence you know, that we need in those financial statements as a platform for, for you know, our, our budgets and future transactions of the authority. Chair, that's probably all I want to, to say on the issue, but happy to answer any questions, but cognizant of the fact that we did have that training session last week. Indeed. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Mr. Richards. And if you can again uh, confirm the thanks of the committee to uh, Mr. Filmer for uh, his input into that, uh, and indeed the follow through that he's made in emails since that meeting last week. Very much appreciated by this committee. Uh, and I think we were very pleased with the way in which he presented it to us. It was clear, it was understandable, uh, and uh, it was uh, something that was accessible to all members, regardless of experience, and for that we're very grateful. Um, I don't anticipate any follow-through from that, because we obviously will await uh, the, the uh, meeting uh, in January. Um, so I think... No members have indicated that they wish to speak to it. But again, our thanks to you and your team, because we realise and appreciate how much work goes into this uh, statement of accounts. Um, and um, it then is presented to us uh, after all of that work. And we can see the detail of, of the work that you have done. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much indeed. So we move on now to item seven on the agenda, which is the report of the Constitution Review Working Group changes to the Constitution. And um, uh, members will be, uh, I suspect, more than familiar with this subject from our online audit and governance meeting on the Constitutional Review from last evening. And so I'm going to ask Mr Jones to run through uh, the process uh, and procedure for this evening's meeting. Uh, on, on the Constitution. Mr Jones. Thank you, Chairman and members. You'll be relieved that I'm not going to rerun through all of the Constitution parts. Um, but just to remind members that the committee, as the Chairman said, met yesterday evening as a virtual meeting uh, to discuss in detail the proposed uh, changes to the Constitution as previously considered by the Constitution Review Working Group. Uh, since the meeting uh, last uh, since the meeting last night was a virtual meeting the committee could not make a formal resolution uh, and therefore um, you reached uh, by the end of the meeting last night you reached a agreement on a series of recommendations uh, earlier today we've pulled together those recommendations that you uh, agreed informally last night uh, and we have circulated a copy of those by email earlier today I've circulated a copy to members in the room here and if any member comes in and they haven't got a copy of those, then I can uh, provide a copy in due course. Um, the committee this evening, though, must pass that formal resolution. So uh, regarding the changes to the constitution, 
Uh, the recommendations will require moving and seconding and then put to the vote. To clarify, only those councillors who attended the virtual meeting yesterday evening and are now present in the room this evening may vote on this matter. Uh, the recommendations from this evening will be forwarded to full council in January for consideration. Thank you very much indeed for that, Mr. James. Uh, and in thanking you for introducing the item, uh, our thanks again uh, for in this public meeting this evening for the immense amount of work uh, that has been done by officers uh, in preparation for last night, most particularly the work that you've done uh, and your democratic services team uh, and uh, Ms. Zeiss from the, uh, from the legal side of the council. Bringing that together last night was an amazing piece of work and um, we're very grateful to your input in helping us to work through that in a, in a sensible way during the course of the meeting. And uh, I'm grateful also to members for their fortitude uh, in spending, uh, I think it was somewhere in excess of three hours last night, going through literally every detail uh, of what was being presented to us. Um, so members, um, the, um, uh, the update has been uh, circulated by email uh, earlier this afternoon. Members in the room have got uh, those uh, on hard copy. Before I move and go through the recommendations, uh, I would just like to make sure that uh, what's in front of you and what uh, Mr Jones has put together for us for this evening accurately reflects uh, what we agreed last night. Um, and. Um, then when I come to moving it, uh, I've been uh, informed that I need to read it out uh, in full for the process of the tape and for members of the public who are perhaps listening into this meeting tonight and were aren't aware of what we, what we discussed and decided uh, last evening. So members, are you content uh, with the way uh, the report has been, um, <coughs> has been constructed? Vice Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we had a, a situation where you had to use your casting vote <coughs> on one item last night. Um, the <coughs> if we vote again tonight, um, you wouldn't be needed to use your casting vote because we're one person down. Indeed. I just draw your attention. Indeed. Thank you. And of course, um, in in going through this process this evening. These are recommendations being made through to full council in January. It'll be for full council to make the decision. These are purely recommendations from this Audit and Governance Committee to that full council meeting. Um, nobody, has, nobody else has indicated. So in that case, um, I, I need to formally move uh, the recommendation on the Constitution Review update uh, arising from uh, last evening's meeting of the committee. And those recommendations state as follows, uh, that the views and recommendations of the Constitution Review Working Group, as considered by the Audit and Governance Committee, and as set out in the relevant parts of the Constitution, be approved as follows. One, that the proposed changes to part one, Constitution summary and explanation, be adopted. Two, that the proposed changes to part two, Articles of the Constitution be adopted subject to the following amendments. Article 3, paragraph 3.1.4a, relating to the rights of the public being amended to read, complain to the Council where there is an alleged breach of the Councillor's Code of Conduct. The arrangements for dealing with allegations of breach of the Code of Conduct for Councillors is set out in Schedule 1 to Part 6 of this Constitution. Three, that subject to four below, the proposed changes to part three, responsibility for function and officer scheme of delegation be adopted subject to part 3A paragraph 7.1.1 being deleted, i.e. the removal of responsibility for personnel related appeals. Four, that a place overview and scrutiny committee comprising 11 members meeting six times per annum be established from the annual meeting of council in May 2022, subject to the remit as outlined in part 3A, paragraphs 4.7 and 4.8 of the proposed constitution being amended to read at 4.7, 
the Place Overview and Scrutiny Committee will be responsible for carrying out those duties as outlined in 4.2.7 and 4.2.13 above in relation to matters such as strategic planning, house building, homes, environment, cleansing, waste, transport and sustainability. And at 4.8, this committee carries out all the Council's overview and scrutiny functions relating to flood risk management as required by legislation. Five, that the proposed changes to part four procedure rules be adopted subject to firstly the words a councillor may in part 4d paragraph 13.17 points of order and 13.18 personal explanation being replaced with a member of the meeting may and two part 4d paragraph 24.1 disorderly conduct by councillors Second sentence being amended to read, if the misconduct continues, the person presiding or any other councillor may move that the councillor be not further heard for this item being debated or that the councillor be not further heard for the remainder of the meeting. And six, that the proposed changes to part six code of conduct and protocols be adopted subject to the inclusion of the planning committee protocol for public speaking as a local protocol within this part and b that necessary and consequential technical and formatting related updates and revisions to the constitution including the minor textual corrections identified by the audit and governance committee be made by the monitoring officer in accordance with the powers delegated I so move, and I think, Vice Chairman, you're going to second. I am indeed. So, members, um, could we go to the vote um, on that recommendation or that set of recommendations? Um, and um, I will ask those in favour, please, to indicate. Sorry, before I do, Councillor Cox. Thank <coughs> I'm, I'm very much against one little bit, which I think I made my views clear last night, is, is that I, I'd quite like to vote for it all apart from that. Is there any way that I could do that? Um, Mr Hanson, can you advise? Well, well the only way would be to pro pro propose an amendment to what you've um, proposed and, and then exactly the same subject of what the council wanted to raise and then you'd have to vote on it as a moment. Ms. I wonder if I could suggest a slight alternative to that and that is that uh, Councillor Cox is at liberty to vote whichever way he pleases and the vote will be either carried or lost depending on how the other members of this committee vote. I don't think necessarily there's a need for an amendment, it's a proposal put forward uh, on which Councillor Cox can vote. So I would, I would make the point, though, that we did um, deal with these issues on a majority basis, and then the composite of all of that is what we agreed at the end of the meeting last okay. night. And whilst I don't agree with absolutely everything in, no, no, in, no, in the proposals, no. uh, I think the point I made at the meeting last night in bringing that composite together at the end of the meeting was that, of course, when it gets to full council, every single member of the 76 members of the council will have the opportunity to speak and to vote accordingly at that stage. And we've tried to take this forward on a majority, as indeed we did through the Constitutional Review Working Group, where again, in my case, I was outnumbered by others on that group um, and um, accepted it as the majority decision. No, I accept that, yeah, Mr Chairman, and uh, I shall vote for. As a Thank you very sit. much indeed, <laughs> Councillor Cox. No, I, I appreciate there are differing views. So could we now go to the vote? I don't particularly want to read out the recommendation again, if I can possibly avoid it. Uh, so all those in favour, please indicate. One, two, three, four, six, seven, so that vote uh, is unanimous from the vote from the members who are present here in this meeting this evening. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you again for your industry last night. It was very much appreciated. Uh, the final item uh, on um, 
the Constitutional Review Working Group that I would like to mention is those items which came up at our meeting last night, which were not covered and which we agreed uh, that we would take forward to a future meeting of the Constitutional Review Working Group. I'll, I'll just, um, there are five of them, and I'll just mention them, if I may, uh, in this public meeting, uh, in order that members of the committee know that they haven't been lost or forgotten. They will be coming back, uh, and the chair and the vice chair of the working group are both here this evening in the form of um, Councillor Williams and Councillor Butt. So the five issues were, uh, in, in, in brief, firstly, the number of members on overview and scrutiny boards and committees. Secondly, clarification about the powers of the head of paid service in relation to contracted workers. Thirdly, issues around standing to speak at council and associated etiquette. Fourthly, process for interpretation of procedure rules. In other words, who has the final say? And the fifth and final one, code of conduct issues dealing with complaints by councillors against fellow councillors. Those were issues that came up, not covered. And of course, uh, we will go out again to members of the council generally and canvas for whether there are any other issues for the Constitutional Review Working Group to consider when it's reconvened next. Uh, these five issues, of course, will get priority, if at all possible, because they're the, the ones that came out from last night. So I hope members are satisfied with the way we've set out the process looking forward, um, subject, of course, to the Council uh, considering the issues that we've just voted to, to uh, move forward with the recommendation. Thank you very much, members. Um, takes us on to item eight on our agenda this evening, uh, which is uh, BCP Council Parks Governance Arrangements. Um, and... Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Stannard, uh, the Head of Audit and Management Assurance, to introduce this item. And uh, then we're going to uh, refer to Kate Langdown, the Council's Director of Environment, uh, to take the matter forward uh, for us. And then there'll be time for members to ask questions once the presentation has taken place. Mr. Stannard. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just spent a few minutes um, recapping uh, and reminding why this report is um, with us tonight. Um, so the annual governance statement of the council identified some weaknesses um, in arrangements with external bodies, whether they be through a partnership, um, contractual trust or foundation arrangement. Um, and as part of the annual governance statement action plan, it was agreed that audit and governance would do a series of deeper dive um, assurance reviews and uh, parks being one. Uh, others included um, BH Live, you'll remember, and the um, Bournemouth Development Company. Um, so on the 10th of June um, this year, Audit and Governance Committee received a presentation from Michael Rowland, uh, who was the strategic lead for green space and conservation. And as we were told on that evening, he would be leaving the council. Um, that review, is, uh, sorry, that presentation is shown at Appendix A of your pack um, for your convenience. Um, I think it's fair to say that whilst the presentation was a very useful starting point, it did not address all the issues that you as a committee had, and that's why we're here tonight with this um, additional report. Uh, you are particularly keen to understand more about the Future Parks Accelerator Project and the Stour Valley Parks Partnership Initiative uh, and how they mesh together with our existing BCP parks arrangements. Um, you are also keen to understand why some agreed governance arrangements understandably put on hold during the COVID lockdown um, had not been reintroduced in some form or other. So with the um, Chair's permission, um, I would like to call on Kate Landown, Director of Environment, um, to run through Section A of the report. And Kate, I know, has got a couple of colleagues who she may introduce at that point. Before I do so, um, the report also includes uh, Section B and Section C, 
and we don't intend to um, introduce those verbally in any way, but of course we will answer any questions um, councillors have on those sections. So with your agreement, Chair, can I pass over to Kate Langdell? Certainly, Mr Stannard. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, members. Um, my name, as, as, as mentioned, is, is Kate Langdown. I'm the Interim Director for Environment, a position I have held since April this year um, with strategic and operational parks management, including their respective governance, um, being new areas um, of responsibility. Um, it's evident, um, as stated within the report, that there's currently a, a, a a uh, varied legacy of inherited parks governance arrangements with detailed knowledge of all of these reduced over time within the now existing team. Um, it is as such recognised by the service that this is an area for improvement and in taking BCP Council's parks governance forward, um, it is sensible to seek to try to simplify and reduce these arrangements where possible and as such welcomes the proposed recommended commissioning of a comprehensive report um, that assesses all of the trust arrangements in place for parks and open spaces across BCP and produces recommendations for future modern governance arrangements for consideration. Um, at the June um, Audit Governance Committee, um, as stated, um, further information was requested in relation to specific parks projects, partnerships and trusts, and these have been provided within the report in front of you. But to summarise on some of the key ones, the Future Parks Accelerator project um, is a national flagship programme. Um, it's a one-off grant which was not accessible to BCB Council without a collaborative partner, in this instance um, the Parks Foundation. It's supporting pioneering work um, now of one of only eight local authorities across the UK, all seeking to strategically transform their approach to urban green space <clears throat> and um, build sustainable future services where funding is a challenge um, due to them not uh, parks not being um, statutory um, provision for local authorities um, particularly um, impacting potentially our neighborhood parks the project aims are set out in the report and are viewable on the future parks accelerator uh, uh, website itself the project is a, is a pilot um, effectively and will provide a range of options based on its learning, uh, which has been disrupted during the COVID pandemic, so is still ongoing, as to how parks could be governed and maintained uh, for the wider benefit of communities in the future. The findings and options and recommendations for this will be available, uh, we hope, during um, summer of uh, 2022. Um, moving on to the Parks Foundation, which was formerly the Bournemouth Parks Foundation. Um, this is an entirely separate legal entity um, to BCB Council with a memorandum of understanding which allows the Park Foundation to operate on BCP um, owned um, land in pursuit of shared um, objectives. Um, this model is seen um, by national partners um, as a innovative approach to um, delivering additionality um, currently beyond um, the council's ability. Um, it's accepted by both the Park Service and the Parks Foundations themselves that the MOU is in need of updating and enhancement um, and the Parks Foundations themselves have recently obtained legal advice um, in relation to this and have shared it with the council and communication remains ongoing um, to progress this. Where the Parks Foundation operate um, and op occupy uh, BCP assets um, to, to further their charitable trading, there are some leases and licenses in place, but there's also a, recommend, uh, a um, recognition that these need updating or enhancing, or actually in some instances actually creating, um, and the service is committed to addressing this. Um, in respect of Lower Gardens, um, this is um, the Lower Gardens Trust. This is an, has an adopted management master plan and detailed management plans uh, with uh, delegated um, responsibilities to officers, um, particularly in respect to uh, the ongoing accreditation for the Green Flag Award. Um, there's a board of trustees that are in place to shape um, strategic matters. Um, throughout the pandemic, um, as previously referred to, um, parks officers were redeployed to support wider critical um, environmental services functions, the ongoing delivery that included bereavement services. Um, and as such, um, within the service for, for, for a number of reasons, um, the 
um, board meetings were deprioritized and um, on reflection, I recognise that this should have been communicated uh, to the uh, Board of Trustees and an opportunity should have been given um, for the, for the uh, Board to make representations or, 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 or communicate any areas of concern in relation to this. Um, for that, um, I offer my apologies. Um, officers have worked to secure a provisional date to re-establish Board meetings um, with the 20th of December um, now being communicated out to Board members. Um, should this be acceptable, we, we will um, make arrangements for this to progress. If not, we will be looking at early um, 2022, January 22 um, for that. Um, finally, in relation to the Star Valley Partnership, um, this is a multi-agency collaborative um, piece of work involving over 16 partners covering 15 miles of land um, and the partnership has been recognised as being uh, very advanced in terms of what it's achieving nationally and, it, and has um, interest behind it. Um, BCP councils reconfirmed its commitment to it in ca uh, cabinet on eight, in April uh, 2021. The uh, partnership is currently receiving fund some funding through the Future Parks Accelerator program, uh, which was listed as as one of its key um, key aims, and. Um, that is helping to bring forward um, the, the partnership from a high level concept um, to in spring 22, hopefully delivering to its partners a landscape mark, master plan, a governance model and a forward strategy. Um, partnership discussions remain ongoing um, regard to the, the future options and identifying a lead partner um, beyond the end of the Future Parks funding, which is in 2022. And this will be presented to council um, for a decision. Um, finally, um, I would like to say that while strong parks governance is, of course, an absolutely clear importance and it will be addressed, I would like to assure the committee that BCP Parks Management has and continues to deliver good quality and valued services to our users, um, never more evident than throughout the, uh, the ongoing pandemic when access to open space has been so important amongst our communities. Um, the most recent resident satisfaction survey of, of September this year um, um, is showing an 84% um, percent of respondents stated they were satisfied with their parks and, um, and green spaces against a local government association um, average of 81%. In addition, BCP Council continues to maintain its 23 green flag uh, parks awards um, and is currently making good progress to deliver its first draft um, green infrastructure strategy, uh, which will provide the future strategic objectives uh, for the service, uh, which will move forward uh, to full public consultation and then will be brought forward to Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Langdon. I gathered from Mr. Stan a couple of officers with you um, I do. as well. Would you like to introduce yeah. those for the committee? Apologies. Please? Yes, I should have done so. Um, I have with me um, Ian Poultney, who's our Head of uh, Sustainability and Strategic Development, and Andy MacDonald, who is our Head of Parks and Bereavement Services, and they're here to help with any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much, and welcome to you and to the rest of your team. Um, it's, it's good to see that um, uh, Mr. Pultney and uh, Mr. McDonald are here this evening. Uh, members, uh, do you have any questions for either Ms. Langdon or the other officers? Councillor Cox. Uh, thanks, Kate. That's, that's really useful. Um, I, I've got a question really to do with the um, parish councils. Uh, in, in particular, obviously, Christchurch Park, uh, Town Council, and the the arrangements that there are currently in terms of transferring the parks that are currently in, I think, the ownership uh, of BCP, but they are due to be transferred to um, uh, the Christchurch Town Council, and I think it's the same also applies to Highcliffe and Walkford. Um, whereby there, there was an agreement prior to the merger um, that these, when, when, the, when the parish councils were in a fit state, they would be transferred over with income. And, um, and I just wanted to, and th there's, a, there's a strong rumour within the, certainly within Christchurch, uh, that, that BCP are going to go back on this, are planning to go back on this. Uh, and so I just want some reassurance that, um, that those agreements will be honoured. Uh, and that um, the transfer of the parks and recreation grounds that are currently held in trust 
um, by BCP on behalf of the parish councils will be sent over with their diaries, I'm told, um, as soon as possible. Ms Langdon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I can confirm that um, discussions are ongoing in relation to the transfers um, and um, that's in part due to um, some additions that have been requested by the parish councils themselves and um, it, just individual details on, on specific sites. But we are um, fully supporting and engaging in those conversations um, and are, are keen to see them uh, reach conclusion also. Excellent. Thank you very much. Councillor Phipps. Thank you very much. Um, just going to the report, um, starting with, I think it's page 228, is it? Um, the here and now, let me just bring it up. Yeah, OK. Just, just sort of starting on that, it, it basically says that BCP has got a limited control or influence over separate legal entities, which the Parks Foundation is. Um, and I think that's pretty much the heart of it here, is the, I suppose, the relationship between the two. But even though the Parks Foundation is a separate legal entity, Obviously, one of the BCP officers actually wrote the bid, I believe, for the Heritage Lottery funding. I think that's correct. You, could you confirm that? And, but then it was actually submitted by the Parks Foundation. So, OK, fine. Should they not have actually done the bid themselves? Or was it OK for us to be writing that on their behalf? But then the funding, obviously, when it came through, just went straight to the Parks Foundation, which is actually a private charity as a separate entity. And we don't have any control over that at all. And I suppose there's no public scrutiny of that. We're just trying to sort of set, the, set this here as I'm, I'm sort of looking at it. And therefore, presumably, there's no clear audit trail of that money that the Parks Foundation have got through BCP having written the bid and the money being spent on BCP land and BCP assets. Is, is that the case? Just a little bit of clarification. I know I've had, I have asked for a lot of questions and thank you very much, Kate, for what you have sent me, but other members of the committee haven't seen some of the answers that I had from you before. So I thought, I think I just wanted to, you know, bring it out a little bit into, into this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Phipps, for raising those issues. I wonder, Ms Langdon, in, in responding, could you perhaps um, widen that so that it is uh, clearly understandable to anybody else listening into this meeting, particularly if it's a member of the public, so that uh, they get the background and they get, they get the um, complete picture? Uh, and then I might refer back to Mr Stannard um, over the um, uh, the issues that have been raised, if there's anything from the from the governance perspective that he'd like to add, Ms. Langdon. Thank you, Chair. If possible, could I ask my colleague Ian Poultney uh, to pick up this question because I believe he'll be able to provide greater detail than I can myself. Mr. Poultney. Thank you, Chair. So the. The bid made to the Future Parks Foundation, to, to the Heritage Lottery um, team, was a genuine collaborative effort between BCP Council, well, um, at the time, Bournemouth Council and um, the Parks Foundation. So it was, it was done at a time when um, BCP was just about to be formed, and as a consequence, um, it was deemed better um, because we clearly didn't know where responsibilities and such would lie in, 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 the, in the short term that the Parks Foundation actually submitted the bid um, because they had continuity regardless. The, the money that came in um, is it was, was paid to the, the Parks Foundation. It could have been paid to either, either organisation. But again, for, because of the, the continuity side of things, um, we, were, we were still in the throes of disaggregation at the point when the bid was written, and that's why the, the, ultimately the funds were paid to the Parks Foundation. The, the matter of public scrutiny and, and audit, the, the Heritage Lottery team 
regularly scrutinize the, the expenditure in relation to the project. All, all expenditure is submitted to them for approval in the first instance, and they determine whether that's appropriate or not. And then they give us the go ahead, you know, to spend it. And, and if BCP incurs um, expenditure as, on behalf of the project, then it then uh, invoices the Parks Foundation and it recompenses it, it, uh, BCP accordingly. So that is, the, that is the, the process by which funds are moved between the two organisations. And as I say, they are scrutinised on a, on a regular basis by the Her Heritage Lottery, the awarding body themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pulteney. Um, Mr. Stannard, would you like to comment on the, um, uh, on the issues uh, from a governance perspective, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I have a lot to add, actually. I, I think the only thing I can meaningfully do is draw members' attention to paragraph 14. Um, you know, the Parks Foundation are accountable for how the money is spent. Um, and as Ian Portney's just said, um, the, the uh, bidding entities um, who re receive the money from um, are... Um, request um, updates through um, uh, how that money is spent and through the um, quarterly return process. So, um, yeah, I, I can't add a lot more, Chair. No, that's, that's fine. I was just really looking for that management assurance part um, from, from you, from the sort of, if you like, the independent officer looking at this. And I, I think that's what you've confirmed to us. Did you want to come back on anything, Councillor Phipps? Yeah, um, I mean, that is actually quite reassuring because you, you just mentioned paragraph 14. I had a question on that and you just answered it in advance. So thank you very much on that one. Um, I Just still on this section, um, on paragraph 18, I'm really pleased to see legals looking at this. I mean, obviously, you are getting to grips with this now and I'm very pleased that you, you are. Um, and it says there that BCP may not possibly take up its two board positions. Um, so how will the Memorandum of Understanding, which I presume there is there isn't one, but it's going to be updated, I understand, and perhaps be a bit more solid. Um, so how is that going to set out the relationship between the Parks Foundation and BCP? Bearing in mind, I suppose they only operate really on BCP land, don't they? That, that is it. That is all they, they do, really. They were set up to do that. So can you give us any pointers on how the, the Memorandum of Understanding is actually going to be um, you know, strengthened? Ms Langdon? Thank you, Chair. Um, again, if I could direct that at um, Mr Pulteney, because he's been in the discussions with the Parks Foundation about this. Certainly, Mr Pulteney. OK, thank you, Chair. So uh, as, as has already been pointed out, we recognise that the, the current memorandum of understanding is weak um, and that we are looking to review that. Um, we are taking advice from um, both the future, sorry, the Future Box programme in terms of their, their legal support, um, in terms of helping um, draft something that our colleagues in legal services will later be able to review. In terms of um, the board members, so as, as you have already been pointed out, that Mr Rowlands, who is no longer with the council, was formerly a, a member of the board of the Parks Foundation. He has now resigned or is about to resign his position, therefore rendering no council influence from his perspective. We, we still currently have one officer who is not in a managerial position within, within the authority that is represented on the board. However, his term of office is shortly coming to a, a, a close and he will not be seeking re-election to that position. In terms of the manage, management, um, sorry, memorandum of understanding, we are seeking to ensure that any money derived from activities within um, BCP parks will not be subsequently be able to use for any other purpose than the parks themselves in accordance with their articles, of their, their charitable articles of uh, establishment. At this point, we've still got a fair bit of work to do, so it'd be, un it'd be unfair of me to, to, to detail to any greater extent than I already have the, 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 uh, the items of the mem memorandum of, un of understanding, um, but that will be um, 
obviously visible to members at a later date at the point where we are ready to commit to that um, to that document. Thank you. Councillor Phillips, did you want to come back or have you got a further question? I have lots more, but I'll let someone else have a go if you like. And um, I'm uh, quite happy that that is actually really being dealt with now and they'll get into grips with it. Thank you. Vice Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'm a member of the Lower Gardens Trust, as you may or may not know. And um, I can't actually remember the last time we met. I don't think we've actually met as a BCP council. Um, forgive me if I'm wrong, because it has been more than two years since the, uh, the trustees met. Um, I don't think there's any excuse for that length of time that you can offer um, that would make sense, particularly uh, as we now can have meetings online or had, could have meetings online, uh, certainly during the pandemic. Um, and a number of things have happened in the lower gardens, which really I would have thought out of courtesy, we could at least have been told about as individual members. Would you like to comment on that? Ms Langdon, who, who should take this one, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, as, as before, um, really all I can do is, is, is offer my apologies. Um, it, 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 it hasn't been um, deliberate um, by officers. It, it really has been um, a, a, an exceptional period um, for the service um, with competing demands um, for, for quite an extended period of time. Um, I could ask my colleague Andy MacDonald if he can add anything further um, because I know he's in, he was involved in the board previously. Mr MacDonald. Good, good afternoon Chair. So I, I mean I can only apologise as well as Kate has done. Um, as, as we said our team has been extremely busy dealing with various e elements of the pandemic. Um, I think I think the last time we met was September of two years ago, and um, I can only apologise, but I really can't add much more. That I know we have tried to arrange another meeting for December, and hopefully we can move things forward then. I think that would be very much appreciated, and I hope they can get back into the kind of routine that we would normally expect. So thank you for those comments, Councillor Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to understand. Um, the kind of representation that we, uh, the BCP is allowed to have on these trust drug foundations, um, and and it, there does seem to be some reluctance at the moment to take up the two that were allowed on the Parks Foundation. And why would that be, on the basis that it's our land? I would have thought we we, we should be pushing for a greater say. Uh, and it, it, I'd be interested to know who who is entitled to be a trustee or director of these uh, trust drug. Um, foundations and and how do they these people be, get to be appointed um and what influence do we have on who gets appointed because there may be some people that we may not want to be appointed <laughs> thank you thank you councillor Cox, for that question you've you've preempted one that i wanted to ask so i'm sure that was a thought in the minds of all members here today miss langdon Sorry, stuck on mute. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, if we are, if we're talking in reference to um, the Parks Foundation, um, again, historically, um, my understanding is that um, during its formation, it was recognised that to to uh, um, attract maximum charitable income and grant funding opportunities, um, it, that the the, the foundation should remain independent and be able to operate um, without um, political influence in that um, that's sort of based off of industry evidence at the time was that members of the public are more likely to give, um, I don't know, maybe for example, uh, charities where the interest of, of the parks is the primary focus as opposed to a council where we have a multitude of other competing financial responsibilities. Um, I think in terms of, if, of, of of board membership um, and, and, and how the Parks Foundation determine that, I think that would have to be a question to the foundation itself. Um, and um, in relation to the Lower Gardens Trust, I believe that has, um, is it four or five members? Sorry, Andy, can you help me with this one? Five, he's advising. 
So I think I think the crux of what Councillor Cox is asking is around the governance arrangements and our responsibility uh, to ensure those governance arrangements are robust uh, and are actually being enforced. Um, and I'm not sure whether your response actually gives us that um, that understanding and comfort that perhaps the question was looking for. OK, um, I mean, I, again, um, the, the Parks Foundation is a, um, a separate legal entity, so I think um, that it, it really is a question for the, for the Parks Foundation itself. Um, in relation to the um, Lower Gardens Trust, um, I believe that there is a need to, to review um, that and that that's been picked up um, as part of the, the audit recommendations that that's something we do want to move forward. Sorry, Andy, did you want to come in? Mr McDonald? Oh, you're on mute, Andy. Again, me. I wanted to correct myself. It's actually four councillors and three co-optees on the Lower Gardens Trust Board, of which the councillors are the only ones with voting rights, I believe. Uh, Councillor Cox. That, that, and, and, that, and clearly we have control over what goes on in the Lower Garden as Trust. So that's, I don't see any issue with that particularly, although obviously it goes against your earlier statement about um, attracting outside funds. Um, now, the, the foundation I, I completely accept is an independent organisation and I, and I understand that argument about um, keeping it separate from, a, from political involvement. But the, 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 there should be some um, governance arrangements. So, you know, that well, we should be aware of what the governance arrangements are uh, to stop it being effectively taken over. I, I'm, I do a lot of charities in my line of work and, and I see and I see other charities, not none of my clients, I'd say, uh, where, where they get taken over. You know, they, they, they could, there could be a takeover of people that you, you, you may not want to, to have involved in running the parks uh, in Bournemouth and um, and so I, I, I do strongly urge the council um, to make sure uh, that we are aware of what those arrangements are and we make sure that we regularly check to to see that the you know that these are being adhered to and that um, they're robust. Uh, so could I pose a question to Mr Stannard who I think wants to come in anyway uh, because I want to make sure that out of this meeting this evening, uh, we have outcomes that are going to satisfy those questions around governance in particular. Mr Stannard. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, with regard to um, Councillor Cox's um, earlier question, I think the um, paragraph 17 helps a little. Um, the current working hypoth hypothesis is that a more robust memorandum of understanding will help us um, understand and improve the governance between us and the Parks Foundation more so than having two representatives on the board. Now that's a, a working hypothesis that we still need to work through. Um, um, there are some other elements such as the um, um, council influence company and, and, and in legal terms, what is a council influence company? Um, as, as alluded to in paragraph 17, um, the Parks Foundation have got their own legal advice on that. Obviously, we need to review that ourselves. And being a council influence company has drawbacks for the Parks Foundation and the council, most notably around what was used to be called state aid um, now called um, subsidy control regime. So um, we just need to work those things through. Uh, Councillor Cox, do you, you want to come back? Uh, yeah, if I could just come back on that. I, I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm, um, I can't remember the expression you used, but I wasn't terribly comforted by it. Um, but the I am aware, I, I have to give an example because there's the only way I can do it, uh, is that of a, a, a good client I have, which is called London Youth Games, uh, and th they have uh, uh, non-voting representatives on their board from the Sports Council, or well, Sporting one as it is now. Uh, 
uh, and it's just to keep an eye on it because they they give money to to that charity, and it's just for them to keep an eye on and make sure it's being done properly. And and I and I see no no reason at all why BCP shouldn't have a similar arrangement so that we, you know, somebody keeps an eye on it and make sure that um, uh, the the foundation is being operated and run uh, as we would want it to be. I I I feel very uncomfortable if we didn't have anybody going along there to to check out what was going on. So just to, to satisfy my curiosity and to follow through from Councillor Cox's comment, on this nine person board, we have the opportunity to have two representatives of um, BCP Council. Um, and yet we are considering declining that. And I'm, I'm just concerned, like Councillor Cox, I think about those governance arrangements and actually being able to keep abreast of them from the council's point of view uh, over what are essentially council assets. Mr Stannard, can you perhaps suggest a way forward for us? I think all I can say, um, Chair, is to reassure you that there, there's, no, um, there's no outcome yet. You know, this is all up for grabs and, and you know, further work needs to be done for the council to crystallise its own view on this because, you know, the Parks Foundation, I think, have their view, um, but we need to um, obtain our view and be clear on that before we make judgments. Indeed. So I, I think there's probably some reporting back required because our remit around the governance arrangements is very clear. And I think we all want to be sure uh, that decisions aren't being taken to weaken those. Um, without them having gone through proper and due process. And uh, I, I'm just concerned that these events may get ahead of us and ahead of those governance arrangements uh, if we don't put a marker down that we expect that to come back to us at some stage. Does that satisfy your question, Councillor Cox? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Filer. Yes, I think I'm... Um, th thank you for that. And it's been quite an eye-opener Kate, to uh, see how many trusts and how many... Uh, I've, I've jotted down quickly, I read the report earlier on, but the Parks Foundation, the Star Valley Partnership, this evening we've heard about parish councils, the Five Parks Trust, the Lower Gardens Trust. Some of those, I know certainly the ones in Bournemouth are, are well, certainly 100 years old, some of them more, and they'll have their own rules and regulations and their stipulations and things forbidden. And it concerns me that there has to be a degree of consistency because as far as the public are concerned, a park will be something that's run by BCP. Um, the actual governance being the Five Parks Trust or the Star Valley Partnership would, would well, it, it, it's arcane and it's not something that they would understand. So if we don't have people on the boards of all of these who are allowed to take up the trust? How do we ever get that consistency um, and the continuity? Um, and how, I mean, how can you, how could you stop, for example, one of those um, beings decide to dig up the whole of the park and turn it into a, an allotment? Um, if we don't have anybody there to see what's going on, um, we, 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 we can't control it at all. And at the end of the day, it is our land albeit occupied by um, other other trusts and foundations. Ms Langdon. Thank you, Chair, um, um, and thank you, Councillor Filer. I think um, it, you're right. In, in essence, you know, the, the, these are these are this is our land. This is BCP land. So the um, the, the opportunity for for people do to do things um, on our land without our permission. Um, should 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 be secured um that that that, that can't happen that, that can't take place um in, in terms of uh, of future governance at the moment the, some of these are say they're pilot projects and they will bring Bring reports forward on options on future governance around around them. The needs of our parks are changing, um, and um, we need to be best placed to respond to that. Um, but it, it, as I say, th th these are all work in progress, both the Star Valley Partnership um, and the Future Parks Accelerator program. So it is too early to say um, what that means in in terms of future governance models for them. Thank you. 
thank you for that response. I think, I hope that the message from this audit and governance committee is coming back to you that we do expect to uh, be informed as to progress uh, around these issues before final decisions are made in order that we can test those governance arrangements. And I just want to make sure that we've put down that marker and that uh, actually that happens in a timely way against the rest of the procedure that you're going through. And I think that's what members are driving at this evening in particular. It's not, it's not necessarily a criticism, it's just to look for that assurance uh, around the continuity of the governance arrangements to ensure that we are seeing them to be robust and enforced and that we're content with the way that they're being processed. Um, Councillor Phipps, you wanted to come back. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a, a comment to start with, really, to agree um, very much with what has, has been said about having representatives from this council on the, the Parts Foundation. And I don't think it is right that they should be officers. I, I think they need to be members. And even if they are, as you want to put it, Councillor Cox, you know, non-voting or whatever, but it's it's a, a brief, isn't it? It's like a watching brief. It, it's on. This is all operating on BCP land, and we need to know what is happening. Um, I think the way it was before, with just officers on there, wasn't right, and it didn't seem right. And that's why possibly we uh, the Park Foundation was considered to be a council-influenced company, which is obviously in the notes here. So obviously, I'm really pleased that you're looking at it. And this memorandum of understanding does need to be strong. And I think we, if something's coming back here, we need to see this and see what's going on and, and maybe have the opportunity to comment on it. Possibly not just this committee, I don't know. But in first instance, that's why, why we're here and we're, we're looking at it. So that that is my thoughts on that. Um, I do have a few more questions. I don't know how far you want me to go down here. I've probably got about five at the moment. Should I just do a few down to as far as the uh, Five Parks Trust, which is well about as far as we've got through the report? Yes, I think if, if you can make them relatively brief, yeah, because I okay. do suspect that we're going to revisit this in the light of the comments yeah, I made. I mean, I've got some ago. on the Star Valley Partnership, but that's further down the report. I'm trying to take it in some sort of order. Um, my first one was a Future Parks Accelerator. You mentioned that. Um, and paragraph 12 has got um, outcomes and, and it says that the findings and options and recommendations are anticipated to be available in the second quarter of 2022. I just wondered how that's only sort of four months away or whatever. How far have we got with that? Are there some really good outcomes yet uh, already? Um, because I know that the um, HLF submission, there were seven, at least seven project outcomes that were anticipated. So that's the first one. Um, Lower Gardens Trust and also the Five Parts Trust. I understand as trusts, they're supposed to have memorandums and articles, and um, these have been in existence for quite some time. Are those being re-looked at um, to bring them up to date on both of them? And on the Five Parts Trust, why is there no board? Thanks. Ms Langdon. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to the Future Parks Accelerator, um, yes, there has been um, considerable learning um, to date um, and that's being collated um, and will be shared at, at the earliest opportunity, um, but we're not yet at the end of the programme, um, so that there is there is more, more to come um, on that front. Um, in relation to the other, all the other trusts and the Articles Association, I think that, that goes back to um, right at the beginning where we, we are recommending that, that um, legal do um, undertake a review um, on behalf of, um, of the um, all of BCP's parks and open spaces uh, where trusts and other arrangements are in place and make recommendations there um, and unfortunately I can't answer the question as to why there is no board um, in relation to the uh, five parks trust um, I have no knowledge um, I don't know if my colleague Andy McDonald may have. Good afternoon chair so um, I mean just to clarify that both those trusts, the Lower Gardens Trust and Five Parks, are actually the, the council are the trustees and it's their this final decision on those. On the Five Parks, I mean, I've been here 32 years and there's never been a board of trustees. So I can't answer why there was one never set up. I mean, I know the Lower Gardens was set up around 2011 
when um, the changes in ownership occurred between Merrick Park and how we could use that land. And that's, it's always been going since then. Um, so basically, I mean, I know it was delegated to officers to run the five parks, and that's that's my understanding. It's been the case for a fair chunk of time, and I'm assuming the work we've asked legal to do will help us clarify that position going forward. Thank you, and I, I'm uh, I'm going to be coming to Ms. Sice, uh for comments around paragraphs 32 and 33 at some stage when I've taken members' questions, and I'm sure that that can be incorporated. Uh, and um, I, I'll wait for her to comment on that presently. Councillor Phipps. Carry on, I've got a couple, two more. Okay. Yeah, well, I've probably got about three more. It's now the Star, Star Valley Partnership, basically. Um, I think I know the answer, but who's now leading on this? Because it was um, the officer that has left. I think it could be Ian, just checking. <laughs> um, so who is our lead now on it, please? Um, also, I just wanted to, to, to get clarification on this, mainly for other members as well. Um, the Parks Foundation remit for the money that came in for Star Valley Partnership from the HLF grant, I believe was to spend it within, it used to be within the um, Bournemouth environs when it was Bournemouth Parks Foundation, but now it's, it's changed. So I, I presume it's within BCP. But they're currently, the Parks Foundation, employing a consultant with the grant money to work on the whole project from Kingston Lacey to Hennesbury Head. Now, are any other partners putting in any money or is it all coming out of this money that has been gone to the Parts Foundation, whose remit I understand is BCP. And I think this is my final question. Um, paragraph 28 says that there's no to be no formal land transfer to the Star Valley Partnership. However, on page 253, that is still shown as um, land to be transferred on the slide. Um, so is there likely to be any transfer of land in the future? And could you just give us a, an explanation on that? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Phipps. Ms Langdon. Uh, Councillor Phipps is correct that um, Ian Poultney has picked up the lead in this area, so I will hand over to him to provide an update. Thank, Thank you, Mr Poultney. Thank you, Chair. So the, the Star Valley partnership the, the Star Valley Park is, is a, and a culmination of many landowners within the, the principle of a park. So it is currently, it does have a red line around it in terms of the geographic locations, but it, it, it's potentially proposed to be broader than that should, should it um, deliver against its objectives. So the, we are currently leading on the Star Valley um, partnership. And we are in conversation with a number of the other partners to see where that, you know, whether we are the most pre appropriate body to continue to lead on that, um, considering we ha we have a relatively small land ho holding as a percentage of the whole park in its entirety. Um, and that is with, with the conversations we're taking place with Natural England, uh, the National Trust, the Heritage Lottery, um, DEFRA, and all manner of other uh, interested stakeholders that are helping us develop the principles of that that park. Um, in terms of land transfer, um, we have no we have no um, intentions at this point, or, or, or there there are no intentions at this point for for BCP to transfer land as such. So the ownership of land won't be transferred into the park; it'll be retained by Peace BCP. But BCP will operate under or or could should members ultimately decide that that's the route they want to take, um, operate within the principles of the park. Um, I, I'm struggling really to, 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 to convey to, to members uh, exactly how it, 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 it would operate, but it, if, if you can consider something a bit like one of the national parks, but on a much smaller scale. Um, so we would, ad we would help advise and set um, aspirations for the way that the, the area is, is managed in terms of portrayal to the public, the uses, um, connectivity and such. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pulteney. Um, so that concludes members' questions, but I want to focus in on um, two parts of uh, the report uh, for uh, further comment um, and process. The first, as I said just a moment ago, uh, is at paragraph 3233, uh, which incorporates the views of the monitoring officer. And I think you've alluded uh, to the uh, external uh, legal support uh, in relation to one or two items. I wonder, Ms. Sice, if you could just comment, uh, perhaps so that we understand more clearly the comprehensive nature of that work that's being commissioned uh, and how that will feed into the process, please. Certainly, Chair. Um, for those who don't know me, I see all officers are introducing themselves, so I'd better as well. My name is Susan Zeiss. I'm the Monitoring Officer and Director of Law and Governance for BCP Council. Um, the work has not yet been commissioned, Chairman. The reason for that is that we, uh, at the moment, are somewhat under-resourced in our legal team. And I had initially wanted to undertake this piece of work myself because, as we've now just heard, possibly some of the origins of the decisions taken have been made by Legacy Council some time ago. And it might ordinarily be uh, more difficult for an external legal services provider to uh, gather all that organizational knowledge and historical information together. Uh, but at the moment, I'm not in a position to take the matter forward. So I will initially commission the uh, external solicitors to do a review of the current governance arrangements. And then hopefully in parallel with that, when things ease up a little uh, just after Christmas, undertake a, a retrospective review of why perhaps we got into those positions so that the council, if the contracts and the charities commission and the various company documents allow, uh, possibly be able to influence some changes that we feel might be possible. I can't say at the moment whether or not anything is possible until we've done that complete review. Um, and I'm not sure how far I'll be able to go back in the record keeping to find out the origin of some of these decisions. Um, but I'm hoping that I will be able to find the information. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Sice. And of course, picking up the point that was made a moment ago uh, around the uh, Bournemouth Five Parks Act uh, issues and the governance arrangements uh, within there. Um, not, not coming at this actually from any particular point of view, but really to seek clarity so that we are content uh, around the arrangements that the council uh, has made. Um, I think all of us would like to get to a position where we are content uh, so that we can see that our work is done. We don't want to do the work of another committee, but we do want to make sure that we've completed ours uh, in a timely way. So that, that work would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And then the other part, I suppose, uh, is in Section C, the summary of findings from recent internal audit. Um, and um, without rehearsing all of those here in the meeting this evening, um, the, the bottom line is that uh, the overall opinion of the audit is likely to be one of partial assurance. Um, and I know that all members will want to see us doing a little bit better than that. Um, and so... Uh, at 30, paragraph 35, uh, some of the key issues are highlighted. Um, and, and frankly, um, at the moment, they are not satisfactory. Um, but I think the process needs to be focused on making sure we get to a position where they can become satisfactory in the future. And again, that this committee has fulfilled its function around those governance arrangements and around that audit report. Uh, for the future, because what we don't want is for this to come back repeatedly to us uh, to try and uh, patch it up and make it better for the future. We want to deal with this as one composite piece of work, I think, uh, so that we can get to the right position. I don't know, Mr Stannard, if you've got anything further you want to add to what you've said in the report at this stage? Um, Chair, you, you've covered the, the, the key bits there. I think it's fair to say this was quite a difficult audit in the sense that, um, as Kate Langdown mentioned, the, the customer satisfaction um, results, I think I'm right in saying that they, they were right up at the top of the council's you know, league table, either first or second, I can't remember which. Um, so 
when when we, we usually couch these audit um, opinions is um, in against um, the ability to meet the council's objectives. And obviously, where we've got excellent customer satisfaction, you know, clearly we're we're delivering objectives. So it was a very, um, you know, notwithstanding the fact that there's obvious governance weaknesses, but fundamentally the parks are at an operational level seem to be delivering what the council wants of them. Um, so that's a, it was a fairly unique audit from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stanard. And I wouldn't want officers to go away thinking uh, anything uh, critical around the physical management uh, of these resources. Far from it. Um, you are to be commended for the way in which uh, our, our parks are managed. Um, and I'd like to make that very clear to all three, uh, to, to you, Kate Langdon, to um, Ian Portney, and indeed to um, Andy McDonald. It is purely around these governance arrangements, but we've got to get that right uh, in a sustainable way because it is our responsibility as a council to do that. Um, and I don't want that to get in the way of the operation, but at the same time, it's really important that we do that. Uh, so thank you, all three of you, for being with us this evening. It's greatly appreciated. Um, and I hope that we can get this to a conclusion uh, in the near term. I don't see any reason why we can't, actually, uh, particularly if that legal work has been done and brought through to us. So I'll, I'll move to the uh, recommendations, but I'm going to add, I'm going to add a third one. Uh, and see how whether that gains support from the committee. So if I could just um, go to the two recommendations that are in the report. Uh, firstly, to note the work underway to confirm the role and relationship between the Parks Foundation and the Council, including further due diligence and a review of the MOU. And secondly, support the view of the monitoring officer that Legal Services Commission in liaison with the Environment Service a report that assesses all the trust arrangements in place for parks and open spaces across BCP and produces recommendations for modern governance arrangements. What I propose to add to that uh, is that um, we, uh, we await uh, an update report um, on these arrangements to be considered at a future meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee um, because I don't want to leave it open-ended. Um, and I think our messages have been clear this evening. I'm sure they've been absorbed by all who are on this meeting or on the call. So if I could just go to those uh, introducing that third recommendation and, and see whether that has the support of the committee. So all those in favour, please indicate. So that's unanimous. Um, if there are any queries about that from the officer perspective, please coordinate with uh, Ms. Seiss, Mr. Stannard, um, or if you misunderstood anything that we've been saying tonight, by all means, uh, coordinate with me as well. Be only too happy to help us get to, the, to get to the finish of this piece of work. So thank you all three very much for attending this evening. It's appreciated. Uh, that takes us on to item nine, uh, on the agenda, which is the process for the appointment of external auditors for 2023-24 through to 2027-28. Uh, and uh, Mr. Stannard, the Head of Audit and Management Assurance, is going to introduce this item. Mr. Stannard. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for um, emphasising the word process there, because um, I, I just want to emphasise that this paper is not about um, deciding if Grant Thornton um, will continue to be our uh, external auditors for the next five-year cycle. Um, it's about the process that we choose to go through to determine our external auditors for the next cycle. Um, so in, in agreeing a process tonight, um, audit and governance need to make a recommendation for council to consider and agree. And we need to, and we need to do this before March the 11th, 2022. Um, so three months time, roughly. Um, and, and it has to be a council decision that's required in statute. Um, so very crudely, um, in summary form, and obviously the report goes into more detail, there are three options um, available to us. 
And um, paragraphs 10 and 11 explain the first two options, really. Um, and they are BCP um, standalone uh, procurement um, to, uh, or second option is for BCP to do it with a partner or partners. Um, and in both of these options, um, I think it's worth as well as stating the obvious that BCP would have to um, commission and or undertake the procurement itself. Um, please note in those paragraphs that we would need to um, create a audit panel which cannot include current or former elected members, current or former officers of the council, all their, all their close friends and family. So that's quite a tall order in identifying people to um, run that uh, panel. Um, so um, the option I'm recommending to you tonight is the uh, National Auditor Appointment Scheme operated by PSAA, Public Sector Audit Appointments, um, which is an entity created by the Secretary of State um, through the LGA. Um, the option is explained in paragraphs 12 and 13, and then confirmed in the assessment of options section of the report, which is paragraph 26 onwards. Um, it's worth noting that 98% of local authorities um, in the current round opted into the national appointment scheme, and that included the three legacy councils, Bournemouth, Christchurch, and Poole councils, of which BCPs inherited that arrangement. Um, and this model is firmly recommended by the LGA um, and I've appended their advice letter at Appendix B to the report. Um, finally, um, I just want to mention a conversation, funnily enough, Councillor Cox and I had the first time we met back in, I think it was 2018-19, um, we were talking about this subject and it stuck in my mind because Councillor Cox is absolutely right and he said something that... Um, a public sector body should not be able to choose its own external auditors. External auditors should be allocated by a regulator or something similar. And that's exactly what PSA is. Um, so with that, for, and, um, I'll, I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr Stannard. Um, members, do you have any questions of Mr Stannard? Or indeed any other officer? Councillor Cox. I'm, I'm, I'm very puzzled by the, the initial statement about not having any current and former councillors and officers. Um, which, so I would have missed what requirement, who, who, states, who states that? Um, that's stated. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, that's stated in the Act <coughs> that um, enshrines the um, external appointments. Um, so it is a statutory requirement. Um, of all local authorities, um, yeah, state requirement of the Act, as simple as that. Thank you. Councillor Fear. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's just, uh, uh, just going through the paper, um, I feel this is more or less straightforward, just go, going from the paper and also going on and, um, and looking at the PSAA's website and what information they offer. Um, like you said, 98% of local authorities do it. The three former ones have done it. Um, the LGA supports it and strongly recommends it. Um, I quite like the, con the consultation policy that, that the PSA uh, AA have, actually. It's quite interesting. So for me, Chair, I feel it's a fairly um, straightforward cut and thrust uh, paper. Um, the other two options, are interesting and like Councillor Cox raised about those um, those members, it would be a very interesting way of trying to get members who, former members, non-members, family members, the Pope, Jesus, every, you know, everyone, it would be an interesting process. So um, I, uh, I would support um, the officer on this. Thank you. I think in, in view, sorry, uh, just in view of those restrictions, uh, which I wasn't aware of, I have to say, uh, I'm, there isn't any alternative. I don't see uh, the other two alternatives as being alternatives, frankly. Um, so I, I think uh, 
it's, I think it's a shame that we, we kind of a bit more involvement in in who we get, uh, but so be it. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, Mr. Stanard. Um, I, I think I've said this in the past, but uh, as a reminder, um, through the PSA process, if we have a stronger view um, about a particular audit firm or a particular um, issue that we have, we can make representation to PSAA and they will consider that. But I'll, I'll use the word consider and they will only consider it, but um, it, that is an option to us if we have a strong view one way or the other on a particular audit firm. Thank you very much. Well, um, I, gauging the temperature of the room, I think I'll move straight to the recommendation and uh, see whether that gets support. Uh, so it's recommended that the Audit and Governance Committee recommends that Council approves the decisions to accept public sector audit appointments, that's the PSAA, uh, invitation to opt into the sector-led option for the appointment of external auditors to principal local government and police bodies for five financial years from the 1st of April 2023. So all those in favour, please indicate. And that again is you. Thank you, members. Um, takes us through to uh, the Audit and Governance Committee forward plan at item 10 on our agenda. Um, and um, uh, I would uh, just just before we uh, just before we go to uh, the detailed uh, forward plan that's been circulated, um, I, I would like to introduce one item. Uh, which is the proposal to have an all-member briefing uh, on the Constitution review. Uh, so we need to get something into the diary, I would suggest, whereby we've got a little bit of time for that Constitution review to be considered, to be presented and considered um, prior to uh, going forward for full council uh, in January. I think it's only right that members have that opportunity rather than just reading the report um, and having a debate uh, and a vote on the night. And it's proposed in a very tight council diary, I have to say. There's been a lot of toing and froing about an available date. Uh, what we've landed on, and it possibly doesn't affect members of this committee as it does other members of the council, because we've all uh, lived and, uh, and experienced the review, um, for Thursday the 6th of January 2022 at 5.30. Um, if we don't go then, um, I fear that we won't find a slot that's at a convenient hour on, on a day prior to that next full council meeting. So that's what we're proposing to do. And my hope is that that can be done in an hour and a half to two hours maximum so that members have that opportunity to, if you like, dig beneath the surface of the report uh, and ask um, questions specifically of officers around how it's going to work in practice. <coughs> so, so with with that, um, could we then move into the forward plan? And I'll ask um, Mr. Stannard to introduce Mr. Stannard. Thank you, Chair. Um, just um, go straight to Appendix A, if I may, and draw your attention to a um, particular change from the last version you've seen at the last committee. Um, 17th of March column, um, you'll see in addition to our standard um, uh, annual reviews, evolutions of uh, agreeing the evolutions of the various policies, uh, whistleblowing, anti-fraud, uh, etc. Um, we've added the um, line tendering stroke use of consultants. Um, Councillor Beasley, you were sent some emails um, requesting that to be added which you agreed to. Um, so um, that was the most sensible meeting to get that to. Um, in addition, um, we've also had um, some correspondences about um, additional restrictions support grant. Um, we have had some email correspondence on that and I've also supplied a briefing note. Um, but subject to that briefing note, um, I think you wanted to um, consider tonight whether you could slot, if members wished, 
uh, a further discussion on that item, um, where it would sit or in this schedule or whether indeed we needed an extra meeting. I think that's right, Councillor. Uh, yes, it is, Mr. Stannard. I think um, I, I think the the meeting on the thirteenth of January is um, full to overflowing at the moment, um, and I'm I'm very keen that we try to keep our meetings as close to a maximum of two hours as we can. Last night was the exception because it necessarily had to be, uh, but I think um, I think uh, interest and com uh, concentration wanes after a couple of hours, uh, and so we will need to find a slot either towards the end of January or the very beginning of February in order to accommodate that. I'm hoping, though, that as we get into the new municipal year, that we can continue with the additional meetings that we've slotted in uh, over the past couple of years to deal with specific to topics outside of our normal, uh, relatively narrow and prescribed remit. And I think there are a number of issues which um, uh, members may wish us to look at considering. I've got a few of my own as well, whereby we can fulfil a, a wider um, governance function uh, through this committee is really important, particularly at this relatively early stage in the life of BCP Council, uh, that we do that uh, on issues that um, require that um, governance overview. And uh, so we're going to have to slot in a number of additional dates uh, over and above the quarterly uh, meetings that are prescribed for us. Um, so if you're content on those future ones, for me, uh, and the vice chairman to work with democratic services to come up with dates when those don't clash with others. And I know Mr. Hampton's already done quite a bit of work on this. Um, then, rather than doing it by committee, which I, I fear won't work, um, if we can come up with some dates, form a timetable within the council's diary for the new uh, council year, uh, and then I will be asking uh, by email members of this committee uh, to. Uh, offer suggestions as to which items we might want to consider for the future and in return I'll offer a few of my own as well uh, and then we can try and form up a, a proper forward plan going through to um, the end of um, April 2023. Does that sound, does that sound broadly uh, at all uh, support going forward? Councillor Phipps? Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you. Um, I was the one that put forward, as we know, the ARG grants and also the one that you very kindly slotted in for March, which is the tendering and use of consultants. So I do think it's very important that if we've got anything, we do need to bring it forward rather than just going with the, uh, what's in front of us and what comes round and round and round. And I think, you know, come up with this stuff if you've got thoughts about it i think we should be discussing it so i'm all for i'm sorry it's an extra meeting maybe and just to say thank you for putting these both in i'm very grateful because um, i think they're really good for discussion and we should have reports on them thank you yes indeed and as i said earlier it does reflect what we've been doing these last couple of years we have been holding additional meetings i'm grateful to officers for accommodating that because there are some resource issues around it but nevertheless we have a job to do and we must do it properly and we must do it fully uh, and some of the issues we've brought forward over and above the regular items I think have proven their worth and I think they'll continue to do so um, so if if you're content Councillor Phipps to leave it uh, to to me and the officers to try and get a date for that um, as indeed we will for the other meetings uh, I just hope it will be there'll be dates that are convenient to members of this committee as far as is possible. But you will understand that we are fairly closely hemmed in. Um, we, we've um, we've agreed this evening, haven't we, to recommend an additional overview and scrutiny. It's take up resource. It's going to take up council diary space as well. Um, and so uh, we we just need to get in there quickly to make sure that we can accommodate our requirements as well. Do you have anything else to add, Mr. Stannard? No? Councillor Rice. Hi, yes, I was just wondering if you could clarify when you would like um, suggestions for items, um, like sort of March, uh, January, February, March, or April. Just wondering. Well, as I said just now, I, sh I should be writing again to members of the committee as I have done on previous occasions. Um, 
probably when we've firmed up some dates so that I get a feel for how much space is available for us. And that, that's something I'll share with members of this committee at that time. Um, but I, I would anticipate that I'll be doing it relatively soon because we need to get that forward plan uh, up and up and set as soon as we can. Thank you. So towards the January end rather than the Well, there are March two, there are two aspects. There's, there's the areas I'm talking about, which are definitive issues. And if we have additional meetings, it may just be a one item agenda or it may be a two or three item agenda. It depends on the length of those reports. Quite separately, of course, are the, are the, governor, uh, are the uh, constitutional review meetings uh, and those uh, are suggestions across the council, not just from this committee. And um, uh, they'll both probably be done at about the same time. I think last year, oh, sorry, last time, I think I did it uh, at the beginning of January. Uh, I may do it before Christmas. It depends on, it depends on uh, what works out with the proposed dates for the forward plan. It'll be relatively soon, though. Uh, so, uh, members, can we uh, can we look to uh, agree uh, the forward plan as far as we are able to? Um, we've we've we're going to have to update it. There is an additional item probably around the parks from tonight that's going to have to be slotted in at a time that's appropriate to the work that's got to be undertaken. Uh, but if we could just agree uh, the forward plan as far as we can see it at the moment and the, the principle that I've explained for the future. Is that agreed? Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, members. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, so that concludes our business for this evening. And I thank you all very much indeed for attending. Uh, thank you to the officers, both here physically in the room and those who've been online uh, for, for attending and for the work that they've done to contribute to this meeting and to the members of the public who may be watching us uh, in our deliberations. And I close the meeting at 19.37. Thank you all.